Hey guys, Stan Blatz here again. I'm going to be taking a short walk through a book of the Bible with you today. Uh, I'm going to start today and can kind of continue on as a bit of a series. The book of Colossians has a very special place in my heart. It's something very dear to me. I love the context and it also is probably the first book that I ever studied um, and tried to find a full grasp and a full meaning of the book. And I think one of the things that can be pointed out immediately in such a short under, short uh, walk through this book, one thing that's really important for me to see and hopefully will be important for you to understand as well, is that the entire Bible is written for our learning. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is written for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So every single book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all written for our learning. We can benefit and be extremely blessed and challenged and corrected and reproved from every single book of the Bible. No doubt about it. And I'm not going to try to uh, rank certain books in, in order as in this one's most important, this one's late, less important. It's not the case at all. But there are a series of books in particular that were written directly to us. We as Gentile Christians, we are not Jews. We were not raised under the old covenant laws and commands. Us as Mennonites, maybe a little bit more so. So sometimes we get a lot of um, value from books that were written to Jewish people as well. But in order for us to understand the Bible correctly, I think we need to see who the books are written to. If you go back to the books, the first five books of Moses, you have to realize it's written directly to the Jews in the Old Testament. He's outlying, outlaying, laying out rather, the books of the old, uh, the laws of God and the commands of God. And he's trying to teach the people how they ought to live according to the law of God. And now um, the early church as well, after the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus was primarily Jewish in nature. Almost everybody for the first 10 or so years was all Jewish people that were being converted and God was adding to the church daily. He wanted them to scatter into the whole world and preach the gospel. It wasn't happening and so finally great persecution came. The Apostle Paul was a part of that persecution. He was chasing Christians from this city to that and putting people in prison and, and it was a terrible time for the church but it was a, of great value to the church at the same time. And so the Lord was adding to the church daily. Paul, when he was converted, you all probably know that story, he was converted on the way to Damascus, and then he was sent by Jesus to go into the Gentile nations, to stand before kings and governors and to be persecuted and suffer in every city that he went to. One thing that you see of him in the book of Acts is he preaches the gospel to Jews first. Almost every city he goes to, he finds his Jewish brethren. And when they will not listen to him, he then becomes, almost sounds like he gets irritated, a little bit frustrated. He's like, fine, that's enough. At one point, he actually shakes off the dust of his feet, takes off his shoes, perhaps, as a big show of, of frustration and says, that's it, I'm done with you. And then one point, he actually says, from this day forward, I will go to the Gentiles only. And it grieves them. You can read about that in the book of, of Romans. He was really grieved that his Jewish brethren would not accept the gospel and he prayed for them. He said he would be willing to give up his own soul to be accursed from the Lord for the Jews' sake. But he became known as the apostle to the Gentiles. And so you take the whole book, you realize the value of it all, but you narrow it down and you see that there are a series of books from Romans to Philemon and maybe even the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a very Jewish book as well, written by the Apostle Paul, written directly to Gentile Christians. It's not disannulling or devaluing any of the other books. I love 1st, 2nd Peter, 3rd, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. All those books are extremely important and have much in them for us. But to me... I guess maybe I'm kind of showing my hand here. The Apostle Paul's writings hold a special place in my heart because they are written so specifically to Gentile Christians. And so when you read this book and, and understand that Paul was writing to you, to us, to us as a church, Gentile people, it becomes that much more valuable. At least to me it does in that way. And, there, and there's many similarities also between Colossians and Ephesians, Colossians and Galatians, Colossians and Romans. There's a lot of cross-reference type of doctrinal statements that uh, go hand in hand. So let's read a couple of verses 
and uh, we'll go into it. We won't get very far because I want to keep these teachings pretty brief. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing I want to point out is that Paul says that he is a sent one, and that's what the word apostle means. In John chapter 13, verse 16, Jesus refers to himself as a sent one. He says that the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. In those words, he that is sent is the exact same Greek word that is translated as apostle. And I'm no Greek scholar. I just looked on the computer program. I know how to find which word is translated which way. And I, I just like to look up and see a deep, deeper, greater depth of meaning for each word. So when I think of the word apostle, by the will of God, apostle by the will of God, the sent one by the will of God, God chose the apostle Paul from his mother's womb. He separated him and made him an apostle to the Gentiles. And so he says, I am an apostle and Timotheus, our brother, is with me. So Paul probably collaborated with Timothy on some of this. Timothy maybe had some insight and some input here and there. We don't, we don't know for sure. But Paul and Timotheus wrote this letter together. And then he says who he's writing to. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus, in Christ, which are at Colossae. You know, the, the Catholics... Uh, venerate saints. They find certain people who they think have become extremely humble, extremely holy, and are without blame and faultless in this world. And then after they have passed on, typically, then they, they become saints. The Pope and maybe a long list of other people have their say and who they think should become a saint, and they make someone a saint. Paul introduces himself as an apostle, and he refers to the Gentile church as saints. Isn't that a beautiful thing? To think, I am Saint Daniel. I already am. I'm not waiting to be. I'm not looking to be venerated by a pope. I'm not waiting to become uh, an elite Christian. Right now, the moment I believe the gospel... If I am a believer in Jesus, if I am a brethren, I think he uses these terms interchangeably, an apostle, or he says, sorry, uh, to the saints and faithful brethren. Saints, and, I don't think he's separating them in classes and saying, I'm talking to the saints and I'm talking to the faithful brethren. You know, the saints are the really holy ones, the faithful brethren are the ones that are working their way up to that. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. He's saying saints and faithful brethren. He's giving us a title and he's recognizing our faithfulness. You, as a faithful Christian, are a saint. And you know that that word saint is the exact same word that's translated holy in the words Holy Spirit. Have you ever been called holy? Holy brethren, saints, this is who we right now are. And I know this might offend some people to say, how can you dare call yourself a saint? I don't dare, but I take God's word for what he has said. Something about what Christ has done, and we'll find out more of this in later portions of this chapter, something about what Christ has done has made us so acceptable before God that he calls us holy, he calls us faithful brethren, he calls us saints of the Most High. To the saints and faithful brethren which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, he, he calls us who we are, he gives us a title, and he recognizes our faithfulness. And then he also says, you who are at this place. Now, saints gather. That's one thing that saints do. They believe on Jesus, and then they gather. And God seems to recognize saints in different localities. He looks geographically to some degree. There is the global worldwide church. That is a thing for sure. But then there is also gatherings of people. Um, Paul introduces Epaphroditus, I believe it is at one time. I might have that wrong, Epaphras maybe. He says about, to the Colossians, he says, who is one of you? And we'll get to that later. He, he is one of you. So where do you belong? Which city, which locality, which group of Christians do you associate with? Who are you one of? And he says here, that he's greeting the saints and the faithful brethren at Colossae. So there is their, their status, their position, their faithfulness, and where they belong. They are the saints and faithful brethren at Colossae. And then he says, peace, grace and peace. And somebody pointed this out a while back. 
peace never comes before grace. It's always grace and then peace because grace is completely undeserved. That's kind of the definition of it. The long-standing definition of the word grace is unmerited favor. One way I like to look at it, and it's easy for me to remember, is G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Beautiful thing to remember. I know that doesn't answer all of the definition of what the word grace means, but if you think of it in those terms, recognizing that whatever grace is, it's God favoring me and me not being worthy of it. I am favored, I am a saint, I am holy, I am accepted, I am loved, not because I deserve it, not because I am worthy, but because God is good, because He is faithful. So grace, and when you receive that grace, when you understand that grace and receive it unto yourself, it will produce peace. Not only will it produce peace, but by the very act of God giving us what we don't deserve, He was actually accomplishing the peace that you and I need. God was angry at the wicked every day, the Bible says in the book of Psalms. He was um, angry with the wicked every day, and he hates all workers of iniquity. And then Jesus stepped in between as our go-between. He received the wrath and the punishment of God upon himself. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then peace was produced. We are now currently at peace with God. And so when Paul is referring or speaking to the Colossians, he says, grace unto you and peace. He wants us to recognize this peace because this objective peace, this peace that is outside of us that Jesus has accomplished for us will also produce a peace in our hearts. It will give us a calm assurance. The Bible talks about a peace that passes all understanding, that it should guard your hearts and minds. So I'm going to stop there. I know that's very, very brief, but I want to keep these messages short and to the point. If you have any input, any say in what you think should be spoken here and, and maybe questions and comments, I'd love to hear them, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, or wherever you end up watching this. I'd love to see some feedback, hear some feedback, and know what it is that you would like me to touch on. But for now, I'm going to close with that. Thanks a lot for tuning in. God bless you.